that kind of that went quick. Mm -hmm. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. How's everybody doing this morning? Good. Good. I don't know if y'all, well, those of you who've been coming, I don't know if y'all noticed when you walked in, but there's a new sign on the building. Makes it easier find it. If you look out on the big sign out on the street, it's there too. We've been waiting for that. We are so thankful for uh, the company that did that for us. They went through some trials getting it to us too because their designer's husband had a stroke and they weren't sure if he was going to make it. So it is a really neat thing. And I found the switch to turn the lights on on it. So we're all going to go. <laughs> this morning we're going to kick off a new series. We just ended here a couple weeks ago the Truth Project, which was a uh, focus on the family. Uh, study that uh, Del Tackett uh, put together. And this one is Genesis History, which we're kicking off today with a sermon series. And then on Wednesday night, we'll go deeper. We'll um, be doing the Bible study for that on Wednesday. Join us seven o'clock break here. It, there's a short video and then we get into discussion. So um, it's a great study and it's gonna go over six topics. And the first one is Genesis as a book of history. Now, I know when people hear the word history, they tend to go, yeah, I don't like history. <laughs> Bear with me, it, it's, it's actually really good. Um, and then we're gonna go through the first seven days next week, man, life, and science, Adam, Eve, and the first sin, the global flood, and then the importance of history. And it's through this study and sermon series that we're gonna be taking a fascinating look at biblical, historical, and scientific evidence for creation and the flood. There's a lot of, uh, controversy that runs in the, uh, now about that. And through this study, we'll learn more uh, from about a dozen scientists and scholars as they explore the world around us in, in light of Genesis. And Dr. Tackett, he's gonna hike, he actually went to different places and he hiked through canyons, he climbed mountains, he dove into the sea in exploration of two competing views and one compelling truth. Now, if you didn't get a chance to join us this past Wednesday when we watched the film, it's about what was it, 101 minutes, like an hour and something. Mm -hmm. Dr. Tackett made this available on YouTube. If you go out to our website and go to, um, in fact, there's a little pop up that's going to come up. Just click his Genesis history. And the very first thing that comes up is the video right on top. You can watch the whole thing. If you watched it with us Wednesday night, you can watch it again. It's a really good film. So the and it's out there for free. What's that? The pictures. The, the pictures were amazing. Beautiful. So we uh, look forward to you joining us for that. Now, that's all that. And then this coming weekend, we're already looking to next Saturday, we have our orange track racing. If you not, don't know what that is, we have a, remember that if, if you remember that orange Hot Wheels track, we have four lanes of it that runs from the door over there to almost to the windows over here. And we race heats. And it's just a great time. We have registration at 9.30 and racing at uh, 10 o'clock. If you want more information about it, it's just simply orangetrackracing.org. You can get to that from our website as well, gracestreet.church. And then coming extremely quickly, see, uh, just a month ago, we were saying, oh, it's we've got two months before the next movie. It's already like a month now. We're gonna show the movie Tulsa. It's inspired by true events. This little girl's mom passes away. She finds her dad, who really doesn't want to be a dad. And they form a bond in Christ that just can't be broken. And that is through our ministry called Grace Street Cinema, where we show a free movie every other month. So looking forward to showing that. That'll be on the 17th, doors open at 5.30. Movie at six. Best part is, it's free. And then those concessions that you pay so much for at the movie theater, yeah, no, as long as they last, they're free to pop, popcorn, mm -hmm. uh, brownie bites, hot dogs, mm -hmm. yes. I think we do regular cheese, mm -hmm. yeah. And uh, the Hawaiian buns sometimes mm -hmm. we get a chance to have, so we look yes, forward we to that. Mm -hmm. Now, for those of you who are wor uh, worshiping, worshiping with us online, mm -hmm. uh, we'll be putting into the chat the worship music for after service. Since we currently don't have our, our worship team, we'll do those videos. But uh, go ahead and find those uh, real quick now out on the feed here. So that's a lot. 
And I know it's a little warm in here. We have the air on, but uh, hopefully it'll cool down by the time we're done. <laughs> well, this morning, as uh, some of you may have heard, Pastor Mark is out of town. Uh, he and I tend to, we try to switch off every other week, but when he's out of town, um, you get me instead. So we like to, to switch things up there. But our call to worship this morning, because we're going to be talking about Genesis, a book of history, and the underlying title to this is the Doctrine of Revelation. And we're going to talk about what that is and explain it so that it, it doesn't sound like those $20 words. But let's start off with our call to worship this morning. But before we do that, let me calm down because, you know, last week this, the message that I gave was be still. Mm -hmm. Psalm 46.10, be still and know that I am God. So I feel rushed. I'm gonna, I just need to center. So... Father, as we prepare to hear your word this morning, let us be still and know that you're God. Let us hear this message that you have provided that is not of us, but it is all of you that we can go through this series. And especially today, as we kick it off with this, uh, this message about Genesis as a book of history, that we can find out where we came from and that as followers and believers in Christ, that there is no question as to whether or not Genesis is history. But we're going to prove it out with, with facts. And we thank you for the message that we're about to hear. Let us permeate, be permeated by the message. Let us be able to use it as we go out into the world and share the hope that we have through your Son, Jesus Christ, and salvation. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. That worked. Our call to worship this morning comes from Proverbs. Unfortunately, it's not my wife's favorite verses, verses 5 and 6, but it's from 19 and 20. And this is from the New International Version where it says, By wisdom the Lord laid the earth's foundations. By understanding he set the heavens in place. By his knowledge the watery depths were divided and the clouds let drop the dew. God's wisdom created harmony in the universe. Do you realize, and, and I did a, uh, well, I didn't do this study. I was a youth pastor many years ago, and one of the kids that was leading it did one on science and how it all ties into that. And one of the sessions, they discussed that if the, and I can't even put my fingers close enough because it, you know, it's so it's minuscule. The Earth's axis was off by just a, a hair. Nothing would exist. We'd either be, it'd be completely frozen, or it'd be, we'd be like Mars, like uninhabitable with heat. Yesterday felt like uninhabitable with heat, but it'd be worse than that. <laughs> it was cool. <laughs> yeah, it was <laughs> Having wisdom means living in conformity with principles embedded in creation. And we're going to talk about that today as well. Wisdom, understanding, and knowledge belonging to God. And in that, we find expression in the act of creation. So, you know, if we go out and, and we don't have to go far we can just go over here to Thomas Park and we can see God's creation with all, all the rest of the noise the buildings and the cars and all of that in this passage the writer points to the purposefulness and design of creation and the order of creation is not totally destroyed by sin and the theology of creation is as important is as an important part of wisdom and that is sure bless you so, Genesis as a book of history. Since we're talking about Genesis as a book of history, it's important to know where it came from. First and foremost, it came from God. And I can't start this without going to our statement of faith. And you can find this on our website. If you just go to Grace Street Death Church all the way down the bottom, click statement of faith. And it says this. The scripture both Old and New Testaments are the inspired and infallible revelation of God to man and the authority of faith and conduct. Where it says GSC just in Sir Grace Street Church accepts the Bible as the revealed will of God as the all-sufficient rule of faith and standard for daily living. And it's because of this, this is what we believe. We are, the Bible is our guide. We don't waver from that. 
and it's through the Old Testament and the New Testament that God reveals himself to us. Let him have fun. It's okay. It's all good. Oh, absolutely. If you go through the door there and take a left, you'll find the restrooms in the hallway. Yep. There you go. <coughs> we are informal here. It, it's all good. But as God has revealed himself to us, he has done this through history. He's done it through laws. He's done it through songs. He's done it through prophecy, wisdom, and letters. Those are all the different pieces of the Bible. And since God did not physically put pen to paper, he had to use authors, human authors, who were divinely inspired. And while we know who some of those writers are, not every book's author is known. First book that pops into my head is Hebrews. We don't know the writer. But that doesn't change the fact that it's the inspired word of God. Now, interestingly enough, some of the books of the Bible, while they have the, their authors are attributed to, say, Paul. Paul had a scribe who wrote his letters for him. In fact, several of his letters at the end, it the scribe will come up and say, my name is, and it, he'll say that I'm writing this, and then we'll get Paul and writing in my own handwriting so that you know that it's from me. And as I was as I was thinking about that, I was thinking, you know, there's a lot of skeptics that say this form of writing isn't it's not, uh, what's the word I want to use here? It's fallible. They think it's fallible. We'll go with that. It, the problem is, is that that is something that is so far from truth. In fact, I'm going to go back here and I'm going to grab a book off of our bookshelf because it's a neat book. Okay, it's missing. I'm not sure where I put it. It's Paradise Lost. We have the book Paradise Lost. We actually have a copy that was printed in the 1800s. I should have looked for that first. But here's the thing. Did you know that the author of Paradise Lost, his name is John Milton. He was blind when he wrote this book. He dictated it to friends and family and anyone else he could, you know, get to help him. Does that make his book any less engaging, any less powerful than it is? No. Now, uh, one of the pastors that we'll be hearing from during this series, his name is George Grant. He's a pastor of Parish Presbyterian Church, and that's from the Presbyterian Church in America. It's a little different branch than the one we're normally used to hearing about very conservative church, but he says this, one of the things that is very evident from the Genesis account is that it was intended to be understood as linear history. Now, putting things linearly can be very difficult because in our minds, we put it, we like everything in a nice, neat order, right? That doesn't always happen, but Genesis is written in a way that it is linear. So why are there so many questions surrounding the origins and why are they so darn controversial? The answer, I think, can come from Paul's letter to the Romans. It's in this first chapter that Paul is telling the people uh, that, well, let's just read it. He says, and all of this because they traded the true God for a fake God and worshiped the God they made instead of the God who made them. The God we bless, the God who blesses us. The people chose to reject God. And they became slaves to sin. And this is why he wrote this. Because they traded the true God for a fake God. How often do we do that? I mean, how often are we do, looking for that next great idea or that next great job that's going to pay us so much more money so that we can have so much more stuff? And is that stuff all really necessary? We like to sit at home and and we watch a show called Tiny House Nation. And we watch these people pare down all their belongings to fit in less than 300 square feet. I mean, 
we're talking a smaller space than this room. And we look at each other and say, like, how are we going to do that? <laughs> we know we need to pare down what we have, but how are we going to do that? Well, it's, we have to be careful that we're not replacing God with other things, that we make idols. Now, at this point, I had a whole other page and a half of, of stuff written. And then I looked at it and I went, oh, wait. That falls under the first seven days. That falls under creation. So I had to put the brakes on and remind myself that the doctrine of creation is next week. And Pastor Mark will be bringing us that message. This week, we're going to be looking at, like I mentioned earlier, the doctrine of revelation. Now, what is that? We've got two $20 words here that we really need to break down. Doctrine simply is that belief or set of beliefs that are taught. Pretty easy, right? Revelation. Is the act of revealing or communicating divine truth. In other words, something that is revealed by God to us. Now, we're going to pick up on that part of it here in a little bit. I want to look at some other things here real quick before we do that. And do you realize it's only been in the last 150 to 200 years that the 24 by 6 view or younger view has been challenged? And what, this is part of what. This is part of that rabbit hole I went down, but it, it ties into next week. Much of this has been due to modern science. And as we will see over the coming weeks, this is being challenged. Modern science challenged the 24-6 creation, but science is now coming into agreement with 24-6 creation. So if you've read the first few chapters of Genesis, and, and by the way, before you come Wednesday night, read the first 11 chapters. Get ready for that. Read the first 11 chapters. But when you read the first few chapters, you can see why they are so controversial. And what does controversy do to people? It makes them uncomfortable. When, do you like talking to people that you're in conflict with? If you're having a, a mis- Understanding with someone, do you really want to sit down and talk to them about it? Mm -hmm. Not so much. But here's the thing when people get uncomfortable, what do they do? They compromise. And that's what's happening right now. That's what's been happening over the last 150 to 200 years. And here's the scary part and this is happening even in the most conservative of Bible colleges and seminaries, they are starting to compromise on the scriptures. And this is leading to very different versions of old earth creationism through which they are trying to marry the biblical account with evolutionary science, and it doesn't work. Now this all ties back to a, a message that we had back in June from the Truth Project series, and it was titled History, Whose Story? And we asked, why is history so important? And the answer was, it teaches. It tells us how we got to where we are. It teaches us that we need to be careful of historical revisionism as well. And that's what we're talking about, the, the changing or that compromise that's happening now. And there are multitudes, multitudes of indicators throughout the Bible that the writers are referring to actual events. And through specific dates, they do that. They do it by identifying locations. They do it by describing geographical features or pointing out man-made monuments that were still existing when the original readers of those texts were alive. Now, history is important. We talk about this all the time. Did you know today is actually a Jewish holiday? It's Tisha B'Havah. And this is a Jewish annual fasting day on which a number of disasters have happened in Jewish history. So it, this festival is because of the destruction of Solomon's temple by the Neo-Babylonian Empire. It's because of the destruction of the second temple by the Roman Empire. It marks the end of three weeks between dire straits and is regarded as the saddest day in the Jewish calendar. But they still celebrate it with fasting and prayer because it's important to remember where they came from. It's important to understand why 
Solomon's temple was destroyed. It was, it's important for them to understand why the second temple was destroyed. What led to those events and how can they learn from them? God left us this historical record so we would remember that's why we have the scriptures. Now, I don't know about you all, but we have uh, on our phones our Amazon and Google both back up our photos. Because heaven forbid we should lose you know, our phone, it gets dropped and destroyed, and we have no photos of our family. And with grandkids running around, that's kind of important to us. We like that. Yesterday, we got a reminder on Amazon. There's a picture of the old school McDonald's, so red roof and the, the yellow highlights around it. And on top of it was this giant Ronald McDonald blow up. <laughs> looking at each other going huh where was this at and we couldn't figure it out we couldn't figure it out and since I'm the tech guy in the family I pulled it up and I looked at the info and the metadata and of course it's old enough that the phone was not location capable so we have no metadata for where it was taken but what we did have is that it was from a phone called the LG rhythm and I knew this was Chris's phone. And that was a basic phone that it was a, they call it a candy bar. It stood like this, had a little ring in it that would light up when it got calls. And you slid it up to get to the keyboard. And so I knew it was Chris's. So Diane took the picture and she sent it to Chris. And she's like, I have no idea. That was like, you know, 13 years ago. But here's the thing. We can look back at history and understand because we have it written, we have it documented. It's more than just a photograph that may or may not jog that memory. Now history can be looked at in one of two ways. History can refer to the written record of people and events in time. So think the book of Kings as the history of Israel. The second way that we can look at it, and this is the way we're going to be looking at history throughout the course of this series and the, the Bible study, is that history can be used in a more comprehensive sense to refer to actual people and events themselves. So think David's flight from Saul after Saul's spirit changed. And if you, I can just see Saul sitting in the room taking his spear and throwing it, hurling it at David, David ducking and going into the wall. And at that point, David knew at some point he was going to have to fly, uh, flee. So as we look at the scriptures, God's revealing actual people, bless you, and events. Now, skeptics would have you believe that these are all fairy tales. And I'm going to challenge anyone who believes that. It's through these people and events in the Bible that God reveals himself to us. So, let's jump back to that doctrine of revelation. So, just to recap, belief or set of beliefs that are taught, God revealing himself through his divine truth. This communication was done both verbally and written. So today you're getting a verbal communication from God. I want you to go home and I want you to read Genesis, bless you, 1 through 11 to get ready for the sermon. So the written portion of it. So here's the thing though. Before the scriptures were written, they were passed from generation to generation verbally. Now, the first question everybody asks in this, won't it get distorted? Isn't this like the telephone? Did y'all play, play the telephone game when you were little? You start with, this, with something and you tell it to the next person, you go all the way around. And by the time it got back to you, it had nothing to do with what you initially said. And when I think I told y'all, when I was a youth pastor, I, I put a spin on that. Every other person had to draw it. They couldn't. So when they drew the picture, they could only show the picture to the next person who then verbally told the next person. And every other, it was even worse. <laughs> but here's the thing. For those who were entrusted on passing on this history, they employed several different strategies. They committed the scriptures to song. And they used... Uh, mnemonics. So mnemonics are, uh, I think of Roy G. Biv. 
That's how I remember the order of the colors in the rainbow. Red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, violet. So they used mnemonics, things of that nature to try and remember, or not to try, but to remember. And here's the thing, they spent their lives doing this. That was their sole job. Now, once the scriptures began to be written, the scribes took great care to make sure there were no mistakes, working upwards of maybe 60 or more hours a week. Now, in their time, they didn't have whiteout. I could have used some off-white beige whiteout yesterday. You see, yesterday I was writing my daughter and her husband's anniversary card. Together is spelled T-O-G-E-H-T-E-R, not T-O-G-H-E-T-H-E-R. <laughs> no whiteout. I wasn't going to scribble it and make it look worse, so I just told her about it. It's like, yeah, your dad's fallible. <laughs> but here's the thing. If they made a mistake when they were writing the scriptures, the whole thing got lost. And they started from scratch. Now, in 1631, King Charles I ordered a thousand Bibles. Now, this is early on. There's a printer named Robert Baker, and he prints these thousand Bibles for him. And it's not until they are delivered that they notice a mistake in Exodus 20, verse 14. One small letter with three words is missing. Do you see which one it is? No. No. Not. It should say, thou shalt not commit adultery. The thousand books went out like that. They became known as the Wicked Bible. And to say the king was not amused would be an understatement, and he ordered all of them destroyed. Here's the thing. Not all of them got destroyed. There are 11 still in existence. And they are worth somewhere between fifty and a hundred thousand dollars apiece. Now, we all know that's an error. Other errors have been made. Here's the thing, though: the, the errors that are made are not trans, uh, translational or theological. Now, skeptics are going to grab onto this, and they're going to trumpet the fact that the Bible's not reliable thing is, there's so much information available proving the Bible's truth that it's overwhelming. And we're going to touch on three of those things today. First of all, there is fulfilled prophecy. The people use all sorts of things to try to predict the future. Non-believers, that is. They try to use horoscopes. They use psychics. I've even seen people try to use that magic eight ball. Oh, well, is it going to work out? This is all unreliable, it's all very vague, and it's just plain wrong. Biblical prophecy is not. So I've got some examples I'm going to uh, put up on the screen. Micah 5, 2, and Luke 2, 4 through 7. These, Micah is the uh, prophecy, Luke is the fulfillment. Jesus would be born in Bethlehem. Number 2, Isaiah 53, 12. And Luke 23, 32 and 33 said Jesus would be condemned with criminals. And we know that Jesus hung on the cross between two criminals. And then the last one I'm going to put up on the screen is from Psalm 22, 16 and John 19, 18. Jesus would have his hands and feet pierced. And here's the thing. When the writer of Psalms wrote this, crucifixion didn't exist. It hadn't been invented yet. That's prophecy. Now there's examples as well that go outside of scriptures. So Matthew 24 and Mark 13 and Luke 21 predict the destruction of Jerusalem. This happened in 70 AD and is recorded by the Roman historian Josephus. Josephus was not religious. He was a secular historian. And then Jeremiah predicts the reinstatement of Israel as a nation in Jeremiah 31. And for almost 2,000 years, 
this prediction was considered a joke. That is until 1948, when Israel became a country again. Now, in addition to fulfilled prophecy, there's archaeological support. Here's, here's a fact for you. Archaeology has never proven the Bible to be false. And more and more through archaeological finds, the Bible is being proven to be actual history. So we're going to look at some examples here. Luke, the author of the Gospel of Luke and Acts, has been proven accurate by archaeology in regards to 32 references to countries, 54 cities, and 9 islands. That's 95 different references, all supported through archaeology. John, the author, the author of the Gospel of John, 1 first, uh, first John, 2 John, 3 John, and Revelation, he mentions in his Gospel that near the pool of Bethsaida, there are five porches. And for years, archaeologists believed John was wrong. That place didn't exist, according to archaeologists. It's been in the last 10 to 20 years, 40 feet underground, they discovered all five porches. The most ancient this, uh, textual evidence that we have is a portion of the Gospel of John. It's on an ancient paper called Papyrus that is dated around 200 AD. There's no other ancient documents that enjoy such a compelling manuscript evidence until this next piece gets verified. There is a papyrus containing the Gospel of Mark that is dated to just over a hundred years old, past the point of Jesus being on earth, but it has yet to be verified. It's a very long process, but if all the rest of this is something that we want to believe, that we believe through archaeology, we can believe that. Now Luke 3, 1 says, it was now the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius, the Roman emperor. Pontius Pilate was governor over Judea. Herod Antipas was ruler over Galilee. His brother Philip was ruler over Ituria and Draconitis. Lysanias was ruler over Abilene. Everybody believed up until just recently that Lysanias didn't exist. That is until an inscription was recently found that has his name on it as the ruler of Italy. Now we had done a, a study here a couple of years ago that we finished up in the Bible overview. Mm -hmm. And in that we learned that critics claimed that the Hittites were a mythical people. The Hittites are mentioned in Genesis 15, Exodus 3, and Joshua 1. Well, let's look at Exodus 3, 8. It says, So I have come down to rescue them from the power of the Egyptians and lead them out of Egypt into their own fertile and spacious land. It is a land flowing with milk and honey, the land where the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites now live. Everybody thought they were mythical, like they didn't exist. It would be like, well, if you're a Star Trek fan, you know the book don't really exist, but... Klingons don't really exist. But the Hittites, in, in the, near the end of the 19th century, William Wright discovered a monument. And in finding that, it got translated. Guess what it proved out? The Hittites existed. So there's our archaeological support. There's much more we could spend all day on this. Let's go to the historical evidence. What is an event in history that you know for a fact occurred? I know for a fact my daughters were born. I was there in the room. <laughs> but here's something that has recently started to come into controversy. We know through documentation, through writings from several different sources, that the first president of the United States was George Washington. Did you know that there's a group of people out there that are questioning that? They say there were presidents before Washington. Well, 
Yes, but no. <laughs> so let me let me explain that. There were 14 men who did serve as president of Congress, not of the United States, of Congress. Here's what they did. The president was a member of Congress that was elected by the other delegates to serve as a neutral discussion moderator during meetings of Congress. It's before the ratification of the Constitution. It all happens before. This was a position that was designed to be largely ceremonial and with relatively no influence and that ended when the Constitution was signed. And we go back to our previous The Truth Project. You can find it on YouTube or on our Facebook page if you haven't seen it, where Mark talks about that. And no, I didn't learn this piece on the um, Schoolhouse Rock video that I, we've been talking about <laughs> recently. I did some research because I had written, uh, been seeing this online a lot, and it, it intrigued me because I love history. And it did take quite a bit of investigation on my part. And yes, there were presidents, but they were presidents of Congress, not presidents of the United States of America. Therefore, George Washington is still the first president. Now, with all the historical exist, uh, evidence that exists through manuscripts, it boggles my mind how critics still dismiss the Bible. These same critics are more than willing to rely on sec secular manuscripts manuscripts of Herodotus, Aristotle, Tescus, and others. And here's a chart, and so we see, here's these authors, here's the dates that they were written. What kills me is the earliest known copies, look at the time span between the date that they were written and the earliest known existing copies, 1300 years, 1400 years, 1000 years, nothing less than 750 years. And not more than 20 known copies, and that's just for one of them. The rest of them are less than 10. Now let's look at the Bible. We have over 24,000. That's a few more than them. 24,000 ancient copies of the New Testament. 230 of them date before 600 AD. Most of them are written within 100 years or 200 years of the actual events. Now, this Wednesday, we're going to dig deeper into how God revealed himself to us, but there are a couple of pieces that come into this revelation of Scripture, of God, um, the revelation of God to us. So there's general revelation and special revelation. We're going to talk about general revelation first. It's God revealing himself generally through the physical attributes of creation, itself. So let's look at Psalm 19 verses 1 through 4 where it says, The heavens proclaim the glory of God. The skies display his craftsmanship. Now, even in a storm, we can see the beauty of God's creation. I, I belong to a weather page on Facebook that posted up before church this morning some lightning strikes over near where I grew up. They are gorgeous. Or the sunsets, or the sunrises, I don't know which. I, I, I don't have a favorite in those. I might have a favorite place to see those, but I, they, God's painting in the sky is absolutely wonderful. Day after day, the psalmist continues, they continue to speak night after night, they make him known. They speak without a sound or word, their voice is never heard, yet their message has gone throughout the earth and their words to all the world. Now think of everything in nature and God's creating of it and how beautiful that is and how it speaks of who he is. Then we're going to jump to verses 7 and 8 of this. And this is where special revelation comes in. This is God revealing himself through personal manifestations and spoken words. The instructions of the Lord are perfect, reviving the soul. The decrees of the Lord are trustworthy making wise the simple. The commandments of the Lord are right, bringing joy to the heart. The commands of the Lord are clear, giving insight for living. See, general revelation will provide us with enough knowledge to know God exists, but it does not record his words and the things that he has done, and that is where special revelation comes in, and that's why it is an important companion 
to the general revelation. That said, there are three important points that we're going to end the message this morning with concerning the doctrine of revelation. The first one is, from the beginning of time, men and women were placed in the world so that they could perceive God's power and divinity in the creation and worship. Romans 1, 18 and 20 from the New Century Version kind of talks about this. It says, God's anger is shown from heaven against all the evil and wrong things people do. By their own evil lives, they hide the truth. God shows his anger because some knowledge of him has been made clear to them. Yes, God has shown himself to them. There are things about him that people cannot see, his eternal power and all the things that make him God. But since the beginning of the world, those things have been easy to understand by what God has made. So people have no excuse for the bad things they do. Secondly, God spoke to select men who accurately recorded his words and actions as well as the events surrounding them. Exodus 24, 3 and 4 says, Then Moses went down to the people and repeated all the instructions and regulations the Lord had given him. This part, the, the Israelites would go on to forget. All the people answered with one voice, We will do everything the Lord has commanded. And then in verse 4, it goes on to tell us that he, Moses carefully wrote down the instructions. In Numbers 33, 1 and 2, it says, These are the sages of the people of Israel when they went out of the land of Egypt by their companies under leadership of Moses and Aaron. Moses wrote down their starting places, stage by stage, by command of the Lord, and these are the stages according to their starting places. So each of them knew when they were to, when they were to get up and leave, each tribe knew where they were to be, what they were to carry, what they were to do. So they got up in an orderly fashion and they moved to the next place that God had directed them to. And finally, God expects us to know the events recorded in the Bible and accept them as history so we can direct our lives according to what he has said and done. So let's look at Matthew 19, 3 and 6 for this one. Some Pharisees came and tried to trap him with this question. Should a man be allowed to divorce his wife for just any reason? Haven't you read the scriptures, Jesus replied? They record that from the beginning God made them male and female. And he said, this explains why a man leaves his father and mother and she joined to his wife, and the two are united into one. Since they are no longer two but one, let no one split apart what God has joined together. And as I was putting this in here, I totally forgot at that time that tomorrow would be Marissa and Gabe's second anniversary. Two people brought together. God put them together. That no one split them apart. The doctrine of revelation is the foundation of how we know who God is and what he has done. So this is where we have to start when we go all the way back to the very beginning. I remember I talked about the controversy of uh, the question of the origins. Well, this is where we have to start when we consider the question of origins. Together, general and special revelation give us an accurate, infinite source of knowledge about God and creation. And this happens through the scriptures. Father God, as we close out our message this morning, Father, we just thank you that you have revealed yourself to us through the scriptures, that you give us your word, your inspired word, that throughout the ages, Father, your word has not, never changed. While there are different translations out there, Father, the message is still the same. It's my prayer, Father, that although people come to a worship service on a Sunday or they may go to a Bible study throughout the week, that they spend time in the scriptures on a daily basis, learning who you are, seeing you revealed for themselves through the scriptures. Father, we just thank you and we praise you and we give all honor and glory to you through your Son, Jesus Christ.
on the night that Jesus was betrayed, he revealed himself to us in a different light. In fact, he revealed the Father to us through that meal. He revealed that he was a servant. He taught us. In a time where he knew he was about to be beaten and hung on that cross, he knew this was coming. He chose to serve the disciples. He chose to teach them one last time, saying, this is my body broken for you. Take and eat. Meaning, this is my body broken for you. I'll be broken on the cross. I'll be nailed to the cross. I will be beaten and whipped. This is for you. Later in the meal, towards the end, he took a cup, filling it, said, this is the cup of the new covenant. My blood poured out for your sin. Take and drink. And we're told in scripture that each time we do this, we're to do so until Jesus returns. He also tells us that he will not partake of this meal again until he returns. So each Sunday as we come together, we celebrate this meal. We look forward to partaking this meal with him when he returns. Let's see. The body of Christ broken for you. Take and eat. And the blood of Christ shed for you. Take and drink. Okay. Heavenly Father, we thank you for what this meal represents. We thank you that each time we come together, we can do so. Taking in this meal together, Father, and reminding us of what your son did on the cross for us and how you continue to reveal yourself in generous to our marriage. In Jesus' name. sister Kim in St. Louis uh, had another episode and is back in the hospital. Oh, no. She just, uh, the facility she's in, she didn't know why she was there, where she was, oh. and so they called 911 and evidently she had a pretty serious seizure in the ER, but they don't know what's going on yet. John's not with us this morning. He has Meniere's disease, which causes him to have vertigo. And he woke up this morning. Um, he was talking about potentially going to the ER today. So. Okay. Okay. And travel. 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 Yeah. Yep. We got that down. That's all the time. <laughs> okay. Well, I'm going to start this morning. Oh, you do? I'm uh, sorry. I've actually got Columbus. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> My sister, Kina, just K-I-N-A, that's not how you spell it, but you know, okay. Kina. Uh, she's in a living condition that is unacceptable. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, we've talked to her several times about doing mm -hmm. something about it, mm -hmm. and I'm just hoping that something will happen in her life to make her make this change because it's not just her it's the people in her house it's her granddaughter it's her sister i hope something someone will inspire her to do what she needs to do to make that change okay. uh my father tommy just got out of the hospital with uh, uh spells of dizziness and this has happened before it's a reoccurring condition and it's not expected to let up anytime soon. Okay. So I'm praying for, for strength and help for him. My sister Toyka, 
also just got out. Also just got out of the hospital with a irregular heart rhythm. Mm -hmm. She had to be her heart had to be shot back into the normal rhythm. She's home again, but she's very weak. And there's still a lot of things that her family look for her to do. She's 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 the pillar of that family. They all look to her. Mm -hmm. Is that it? <laughs> <laughs> for now? Oh, well, it's, uh, <laughs> it's my, my my son Demetrius, he's driving back from I'm gonna say Wisconsin again. It's, it's not it. It's <laughs> with Missouri. Mm -hmm. I don't know why I get those two mixed up. He's driving back from Missouri. He uh, met some friends at a like a river. He got hurt a little bit, but he's oh okay. Gosh. He's oh. okay. He's a big guy, but he's driving six hours home. Oh, so I'm just for travel sick, travels. Yeah. Good for him. That's quite a list today. So, Father God, I pray that you'll give me the direction I need to to have in order to pray for these people. And. Um, so we're going to start this morning with this uh, scripture of hope in Lamentations 3.21.23. But this I call to mind, and therefore I have hope. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. Thank you, Jesus, for your great love and faithfulness. You went willingly to the cross to die, and in three days you rose again giving us your blood covenant that will heal our, dis our diseases, cover our sins, and wash away all unrighteousness. You give us hope for each new day. Thank you, Jesus, that you walk with us through the storms in our lives. You share our sadness in our distress. You give us comfort and joy when we least expect it. You, put, you pull us up out of the depths of our despair. You are God, and there is no other. Father God, we lift up Mark to you this morning. We ask for safe travels. We ask for healing for his leg that was injured last week and his right thumb on his hand that has been a problem for a while now. We ask you, Father, that since you are the one that created him, that you reconstruct these problem areas and renew him back to the full use of both leg and hand. We thank you and praise you, Father God, for the blessing and your healing power in and through him. Father, we ask for um, prayers for Kim, for her seizures, and also for Tommy, for his um, lightheadedness, and we ask you for strength, and we ask you for healing in their mind and their brain that causes these seizures, Lord Jesus. We ask you that you heal them completely, Father God. We ask for prayers for Kim, who has cancer. Lord Jesus, we, uh, we pray your healing touch upon her. You knit her in, your, in her mother's womb, Lord God. You know her completely. You know what will heal her and what will help her. So put Christian people around her and uh, give her comfort through this time, Lord Jesus, as you heal her body. We ask for um, help for Kina. Um, we ask for intercessory, Lord Jesus, that you would um, give a divine intervention in her life, Lord God, that will um, help her to know that she needs to get the help that she so desperately needs in order to heal and to heal the family Lord Jesus and we ask for Don for vertigo we pray for him that you will heal his his ears and whatever is causing the dizziness Lord Jesus be with Don and uh, grant him peace and comfort today we ask you for um, strength for can't pronounce her name, Tyka? Tyka. Tyka. We ask for strength, Lord Jesus. She's the head of her family, Lord God, and, and she needs your help, Lord Jesus. Just um, intervene and give her strength. Give her people that will help her. Bring people into her life that will give her um, comfort and, um, and will listen. If she has troubles, Lord, help them to listen to her and, and just help her to heal from them and and Lord, just be with her. Be her comfort. Be her rock. Be her strength, Jesus. 
Help her read your word, Lord, that she will um, come to a knowledge of you and just um, lift her up. And Demetrius, from traveling from Missouri, and, um, Lord Jesus, we ask for travel mercies for Demetrius. We ask for healing for whatever has happened. We just pray for all these people, Lord God. You know them fully well. You, um, you take care of us each and every day. You walk with us and you talk with us. Just be with them. Be close at heart, Lord Jesus. People that will love on them and help them through all the trials that they are having. And Father God, we are living in a time of lawlessness, hopelessness, and people have forgotten who you are. You are our creator, our great physician and comforter in all things. Please help our country to repent and renew a steadfast spirit within us. Let the Christian people throughout rise up and boldly proclaim the word of the Lord. Open people's ears that they will hear and believe in the one and only God, the father of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Please renew our spirits, renew our land, renew the heart of this nation to be one nation under God. Thank you, Jesus, for who you are, the powerful, almighty God, the great I am, in Jesus' holy name. Amen. As we close our online portion, I send you out with this benediction that comes from 2 Peter chapter 3. Therefore, dear friends, since you already know this, be on your guard so that you may not be carried away by the error of lawless men and fall from your secure position, but grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To him be the glory both now and forever.